When you point out the problems with germ theory and the fact that diseases such as influenza have never been shown to transmit between humans, the response is often very well, but what about sexually transmitted diseases? Alleged STDs can be bacterial in nature, such as chlamydia and gonorrhea, parasitic, such as trachomoniasis, or, quote, viral, such as HIV and herpes. I thought it would be best to start the series with an alleged STD that is bacterial in nature, because with viruses, there is an additional issue regarding their very proof of existence. So let's take a look at one of the most famous alleged STDs of them all, gonorrhea. We'll see if there's any evidence to it being able to pass from human to human, or if this is germ theory nonsense, and something else altogether is going on with the clap. A 2012 American Medical Association publication informs us that gonorrhea is an ancient disease that was transmitted by Chinese tradesmen bartering their goods, Greek soldiers fighting for new territory, and international businessmen traveling across the world. Gallen, a Greek physician, AD 130 to 200, is credited with naming gonorrhea after gonos, semen, and roya, to flow. By the 1500s, gonorrhea's association with prostitution and sexual activity was noted. Gonorrhea continued to spread from Europe to the New World through seafaring sailors. Despite medical advances and the effective treatment of gonorrhea with present-day antibiotics, the clap continues to spread. Not surprisingly, the majority of people are convinced at this point that we have proof of a sexually transmitted disease. However, when you are suspicious about germ theory claims, a good place to start is Wikipedia. This is not because it is a reliable source of truth, but because it often quickly reveals the lack of evidence behind commonly held beliefs. The page on gonorrhea gets straight into the claims and states that gonorrhea, colloquially known as the clap, is a sexually transmitted infection caused by the bacterium Neisseria gonorrhoeae. There is a single reference for this claim, which takes us to the CDC's gonorrhea fact sheet. So things are looking suspicious already, and we're probably only one step away from a fact-checking website. The CDC page lists 22 scientific references, but conspicuously, there is no reference for the statement that gonorrhea is a sexually transmitted disease caused by infection with the Neisseria gonorrhoeae bacterium. For the rest of their fact sheet, they cite studies concerning epidemiological observations, tests for gonorrhea, laboratory features and treatments such as antibiotics, but none of that constitutes evidence that gonorrhea is sexually transmitted in the form of an actual scientific study showing this is to be the case. And the claims that it is transmissible reached new heights in 2019 when a study concluded that men who have sex with men may be transmitting gonorrhea to each other by kissing. However, their study methodology reveals they were diagnosing, quote, gonorrhea by performing nucleic acid amplification tests on oropharyngeal swabs. The authors admitted the limitations of such tests, noting that we were not able to identify whether the organism was viable or not. In that case, and given they were not reporting on the condition of the subject's mouths, how can they make any claims about diagnosing cases of gonorrhea? And they are still making the assumption that the mere presence of viable Neisseria bacteria would mean the person has a disease. But wait, there's more, as there are even claims that you can get gonorrhea from a toilet seat. However, whether it is historical observations of patterns of gonorrhea, anecdotal stories about toilet seats, or local folklore, there remains a problem with the whole story, and that's actual evidence that human-to-human -human transmission takes place. Remember, we are not talking about the association of Neisseria with illness. We are talking about the specific issue of whether one person who has disease can pass it on to someone else via a microbe. Going back to Wikipedia, we can see the additional dramatic claim that men have a 20% risk of getting the infection from a single act of vaginal intercourse with an infected woman. However, there is no citation for this claim. So, let's have a look at any experimental animal models that have been used to demonstrate transmission. It seems in animals there are difficulties in demonstrating that the Neisseria bacterium alone can do anything to healthy specimens. One animal study is 
Female Mouse Model of Neisseria Gonorrhei in Fiction, published in 2019. Now because these so-called infection experiments don't tend to work with normal mice, they used a type of mice which are inbred, immunodeficient and albino. These abnormal mice were then prepared with injected estradiol and multiple injections of the antibiotics vancomycin, streptomycin and trimethoprim over several days. Once prepped, 20 microliters of a concentrated Neisseria suspension was squirted into the vagina and the mouse was held upside down for one minute. Now, taking an average weight of a six-week-old female mouse to be around 17 grams, by weight this would be equivalent to squirting 70 mils of fluid into a human vagina. To put it in perspective, that's a volume of around a dozen ejaculates going in all at once. Overall, this is a ridiculous animal model to demonstrate that you can squirt bacteria up a vagina and then amazingly you can find the same bacteria in there but then the quote infection starts resolving over the next few days as the bacteria are flushed out. In short, it is a contrived model that doesn't mirror anything that happens in nature. In any case, such experimental designs cannot show transmission of Neisseria between animals or that the bacterium alone can cause a disease state. As a side note, one article that caught my eye with regards to alleged in utero transmission was a 1999 paper titled Experimental Transmission of Neisseria Gonorrhea from Pregnant Rat to Fetus. The methodology involved pregnant rats being quote, infected by injecting bacterial suspensions directly into their abdomens and observing how it could result in fetal death. Such a physical violation is not something that happens in nature, so it can hardly be said to implicate Neisseria as a pathogen in normal settings. But what about the human experiments that were carried out last century? There was the 1944 gonorrhea experiment at the Terre Haute Federal Penitentiary in the United States. In this prison, the volunteers were deliberately injected with gonorrhea. But the Public Health Service had found it difficult to get the men to exhibit infection and the study was abandoned. There was also an experiment that took place in Guatemala in the 1940s with the cooperation of officials at the Ministry of Justice and the Warden of Guatemala City Central's penitentiary which housed nearly 1500 inmates. Prostitutes who tested positive for either syphilis or gonorrhea were allowed to offer their services to prison inmates, paid for by US taxpayers through the funds of the PHS. In yet another set of experiments, uninfected prostitutes had inoculums of the diseases placed on their cervixes before the sexual visits began. Serological tests were done on the inmates before the prostitutes were invited to the prison and then afterward to see if infection had occurred. Rabbits, of course, were much easier to manage and manipulate than human beings, as the doctors soon discovered. Not enough of the sexually well-serviced men, the researchers actually timed how long they spent with the prostitutes and thought they acted like rabbits, even when plied with alcohol, seemed to be getting syphilis. Presumably the same, quote, problem was found with gonorrhea. But wait a minute, there's a lesser known CDC document that claims that human experiments in the 1940s showed that gonorrhea has a whopping 30% infection rate. The document published in 2010 covers the Public Health Service's experiments, some of which I've just mentioned, and is based on the review of archived papers of John Cutler, MD, at the University of Pittsburgh. To me, it is odd that no one has put their name to the authorship of the document. It is simply marked as a CDC report, and it wasn't until a decade ago that they published a document claiming to prove such transmission. They state that a total of 772 subjects of individual experiments, some apparently representing the same patients involved in several experiments, were exposed to infection by sexual contact or inoculation. Of these, a summary report and experimental logs indicate that 234, 30% were infected. But let's take a closer look at the details. They report that 12 women were recruited and inoculated with gonorrhea five to 14 days prior to the studies, while none of the females thus infected showed evidence of acute infection, such as a rich outpouring of thick yellow pus from the cervix or by signs of pelvic inflammatory disease. All of them showed evidence of infection by cervical discharge and all were culture positive. Already we can see the problems. They squirted heavy loads of Neisseria bacterial cultures into the prostitutes' vaginas and then claimed they were, quote, infected because they can detect the same bacteria a week later. 
It was then claimed that this result in quote infections in the male prisoners in only 5 out of 138 exposures. But again it was not clear if this was on the basis of detecting the bacteria rather than having signs or symptoms of the disease. They decided to step it up a notch and found they could achieve more impressive results by quote deep inoculation of the penis. This involved the painful procedure of traumatizing the penis by inserting a toothpick wrapped in bacteria soaked cotton into the urethra. They claimed that this achieved a quote transmission rate of 33%. Again this does not show that the bacteria is the cause of the disease or that it can transmit between humans to cause illness. It shows that if you stick a toothpick into a penis then there will be unpleasant repercussions. In addition there was no mention of any control experiments so none of it was consistent with the scientific method. It was also fascinating to note that this alleged inoculation technique was originally developed by soldiers in World War II who did the procedure to themselves to secure hospitalization and thus avoid going on active duty. Overall it suggests the stories about frisky GIs picking up the clap from dodgy prostitutes during World War II was based on germ theory mythology. So then we get to the summary table of the CDC's report and we see the figure of 30% in the number of subjects judged to be infected in the gonorrhea experiments. However it can be seen that this number is massively inflated by the so-called membrane inoculation techniques involving inflicting trauma on the subjects. Somehow some extra sexual contact numbers popped up in this box, the details of which were not provided in the report. In any case it doesn't really matter because as we have seen from the methodology there were no control experiments, no definition of what constituted gonorrhea which is supposed to be a disease not just detection of a microbe and no evidence that one unwell human could make another human unwell. Of course the germ theory narratives were beneficial to industries with vested interests. For example penicillin went into mass production around 1944 and was considered a wonder cure for gonorrhea. And while antibiotics can kill bacteria and resolve symptoms it is complicated by the fact that they have other effects such as anti-inflammatory properties and the results of antibiotic therapy even if beneficial have nothing to do with whether something is transmitting. So if there is no proof that gonorrhea is a sexually transmitted disease that is caused by Neisseria passing between people, what is going on? Firstly there may be an association of Neisseria with disease in that it proliferates in response to an underlying problem or in other words a change in the terrain. On this account germ theory struggles to explain why half of women with gonorrhea are asymptomatic and this is because the detection of a microbe has been conflated with a disease. Allopathic medicine has developed a habit of combining the word asymptomatic with a disease, particularly when alleged infections are involved. Whenever you see case numbers of what is said to be quote gonorrhea, it is usually just the number of positive test results rather than a measure of disease burden. Secondly we are not denying that there are conditions which involve inflammation of the genital tract, pelvis and rectum. I once worked in a sexual health clinic so I am familiar with the clinical presentations which can range from trivial to very serious. My experience was that the cases tended to be in individuals who had other socioeconomic and health problems going on. Indeed if you look at the risk factors for gonorrhea it includes promiscuity, low socioeconomic status, racial group and homosexual activity in males. Again why would an allegedly highly infectious agent discriminate on the basis of socioeconomic status or race? Such a germ should be able to pass easily into other groups in the same population and start affecting them as well. While we can make no definitive claim that it is impossible for the disease to transmit, the scientific evidence suggests to me that it is another case of terrain theory holding more answers than germ theory nonsense. The mere detection of an organism such as Neisseria, particularly with high sensitive PCR kits, should not be considered a diagnosis in the absence of any disease. And if there is disease, it is better to examine lifestyle factors and general health status for the explanation as to what went wrong. Unfortunately because of the focus on the contagion model there is little published research available in this area and we need to draw on the general principles of terrain theory. In that paradigm it would make sense to avoid traumatic sexual practices which are more common than many people think. 
Exposure to multiple sexual partners may also be detrimental for reasons that have nothing to do with microbes. Optimizing nutrition is in everyone's interests. And like most health concerns, it is better not to assume that there is one factor that has caused the problem. Every individual has a story, and that story will usually provide the answer as to what needs to be brought back into balance. Blaming another person and a microbe for personal health problems is unlikely to bring about true healing from what I can assess. Stay tuned for further videos examining the question of is sexually transmitted disease a thing? And before anyone posts the question of what about HIV, I suggest taking a look at my three-part series, The Yin and Yang of HIV, in particular part two, which deals with the sexual transmission arguments. So that we don't lose touch, please find me at drsambailey.com and sign up for my free newsletter.